Hey everyone, today we're tearing down this. This is the Sapphire RX 5700 XT Nitro Plus OC. It's the full name of the card. And we're gonna be taking it apart, talking about some of the stuff. I have a quick update as well on the uh, BIOS positions, the VBIOS positions from the review. So a lot of this is going to be looking at the cooler specifically. I really am personally interested in if there's clearance for a liquid nitrogen pot on there as well. I know that's a very non-mainstream in uh, consideration, but we'll look at it. And for the review, we have a, re a video up already. It performed exceptionally well in thermals. The auto settings were not aggressive enough, but that's nothing that can't be solved with manual fan curve tuning on your end. And the noise normalized thermals were the best on the charts, hands down by quite a lot in some instances when you power normalize as well. So the review is up. Today we're gonna take it apart, see how the internal build quality of the cooler is, why it's as good as it was, and then uh, see if we can learn anything about the VRM as well. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lid thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. Okay, so we're going to use the Gamers Nexus teardown toolkit for this. You can pick it up on store.gamersnexus.net if you would like to grab one of these. We spec them specifically for video card teardowns. So these are going to be like a pH uh, zero or so size. Pretty simple ones. Just loosen them on each corner first and then remove them completely. It's a four point retention bracket. AMD uses these on theirs. It's a bit different from what NVIDIA does. Okay. All right, so we'll set this aside. This, I'm not sure how many screws this cooler is gonna have. If you're ever taking apart a card that's more complex, like the NVIDIA reference designs, something like this is really helpful for remember in where to put everything, all the different size screws. Uh, so we got the retention plate off, and then these screws are going straight through back plate, through the PCB, and then into a base plate here. That's gonna connect to probably the VRM and may maybe the memory components. So we'll have to take these out as well. Sometimes it's just for the four here, but this is gonna require more of them to be removed. And also I, I do wanna mention this before we get too far into it. So as stated before in the review, obviously triple axial cooler, these are uh, interesting fans because they're different sizes. So if you look kinda not too closely to notice it, but these two outer fans are larger, center ones smaller. The reason for that is if they did this fan the same size as these, then the cooler gets a bit wider still. And right now, it's already pretty close to about the limits of what an acceptable cooler size would be because you're at about almost a foot or roughly 30 centimeters if you prefer. So that's the, the reasoning for that. Now as for the sizes of the fans, just out of interest, these should be roughly a 93 is the kind of standard size. So that's a 93 on the outsides. And then that's gonna be a an 80 something. Actually not sure what the standard 80 mil size is, but that's about 85. So whatever standard is close to that, it's gonna be plus or minus a couple millimeters. But that's the size. And then the switches, uh, so correction on this from the review. I thought this was a triple V BIOS, but actually it's a dual V BIOS and it has three switch positions. And the reason for having three switch positions is just that uh, one of these positions is enabling software control of which VBIOS profile is active. So you can use their TriXX or Trix, what, how, which I think is TriXX software, and uh, use that offset switch position, the one that allows software control, and then it can switch between the other two. So anyway, that was the, uh, the update on it. Otherwise, two of these are, one's a 220 watt, one's a 200 watt, or roughly 195 power limit, and then the other one is a, um, uh, software enablement. So it's not actually a triple V BIOS, but just wanted to update that and let's take apart the rest of it. These are actually all spring tension screws. And uh, as noted, they go all the way through and into a base plate. So that's all the screws securing the backlight. It's pretty simple. Two, three, four, five, plus your standard four. And then over here, these two are gonna have to come out for uh, disconnecting the cooler from itself, the upper and the lower part of the cooler. 
So we'll separate these. These are actually different size screws. Yes. Yeah, so careful if you disassemble this. Don't mix up the screws. Uh, you'll see that those are two different sizes. So we'll track these out at the outer edge. And if you want that, the mod mats on store.gamersnexus as well, along with the toolkit. So we have two small ones up here. That looks like it probably just holds in this LED plate at the top. So thinking we don't need to remove those to get the cooler apart, but we might have to come back to that. And it is separating. Where are we stuck? Let's take out this one here, maybe. That's just for the I.O. plate. That might not need to come out. Oh, interesting. Once I get this apart, we'll be able to see some interesting design choices. OK, so I found the point where it's stuck. Uh, the This is kind of common on the the fatter RTX cards, especially those three slot ones. But there's a set of two screws here you can see. And these two screws are securing uh, just for some extra support. Helps probably reduce sag marginally, although most of the sag's on the other side of the card. But those go in here into the shroud. And that's it. They just go straight into the shroud. So we got to take those two out as well, even though the plate can probably stay on. Nice, OK. Now it's going to be fan headers. As always, don't pull on the cables. I'm actually taking my fingernail and putting it under the edge here. Uh, if you pull on the cables, you can actually rip the header off the PCB. I've done that before. And it's you can reattach it, but it's not really fun. OK. So it is a part. It's actually pretty simple to disassemble compared to the reference designs we see. This is what I was interested in. So we've actually got a, a really significant portion of the heat sink that's attached to the base plate. This is not too dissimilar from the Pulse design for the XT model. It's just that, well, in concept, it's not dissimilar. In execution, it is it's quite different. But yeah, really big heat sink here. That's over the memory and part of the VR at one of the rails. Another heat sink here over memory. And this would explain why the GDDR thermals were as good as they were. And just to recap some previous content from the Gigabyte teardown and the Pulse teardown, if you look at the cooler here, the reason this design works so well is because Sapphire is, and it doesn't always work well, sometimes it can be worse depending on execution, but Sapphire is isolating the GPU cold plate from the memory and the part of the VRM cooling, um, although most of the VRM is over here. But because of that isolation, we learned this with hybrid mods, where if you're sharing the same cooler with more of the card, more components on the card, then the amount of heat and watts that the cooler is soaking will obviously go up. And so your GPU temperatures and junction temperatures will go up with that, but you're cooling more devices, so there's a plus side too. In this instance, Sapphire is cooling just the GPU with the copper cold plate, and then the rest of it, you're going to have a big fin stack here that's not attached to any other part of this solution, cooling solution. And uh, they're going to have another section of fins right in here socketing in there pretty cleanly. So the reason this works, there's plenty of ways it wouldn't work as well if you executed poorly. The reason it works specifically here is because those fins have enough surface area to spread the heat, and then the fans happen to push the air straight through. And there's actually plenty of air paths in here and even in here where the air can get down past the main part of the cooler and into the uh, lesser component cooling. And especially over here, it's got plenty of fan coverage with that larger fan blade. So that's why that design works so well. You're not sharing a single plate to sync everything. And the airflow is coming down here anyway. So might as well use it to an advant uh, advantageous uh, configuration and just split up the two cooling units. Anyway, pretty simple stuff. But um, sometimes we get new people checking out these videos of the more the higher end cards. So it's always worth pointing out. So let's, before we talk more about the cooling, Pull this plate off and expose the rest of the PCB. This is going to have four screws in it. It's aluminum. Uh, sometimes companies will use stainless steel. XFX has done that. It's not great when they do. Most of the time, it's it can be a, an effective enough solution, but uh, better to use aluminum, which is not magnetic. So that's the easiest check. I guess the screwdriver is magnetic, so I'd have known anyway. And this uh, paste job is actually not too bad. 
but it is a little uneven. So you can kind of look here at the edges, how much spread there is on the outside and how even the paste spread is here when you, you learn this doing LN2 overclocking where you're mounting and unmounting an LN2 pot repeatedly, but same idea. And uh, paste spread's not bad. It could have been a little more even on this side biased this direction, but it's not bad for a, a factory paste job. And the thermals were fine, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Okay. Actually, it was just really sticky thermal pads, not more screws. Okay. So some rubber washers in there. Some came off here, but actually those are plastic spacers. And this VRM is pretty big. I'm actually sending this PCB to Buildzoid. He's going to do an analysis for us on our channel, so you can check back to get his PCB analysis of the VRM. I'll mention the component names in here, but we're going to let him do the expert analysis. We'll be focusing uh, for this video more on the thermal solution and the assembly. He's got the electrical solution. So thermal solution, you have a big plate here, base plate, contacting the memory, obviously. Um, Sapphire uses full-size memory uh, thermal pads and then also has these three smaller thermal pads up here contacting, uh, if we associate it to the PCB, contacting part of the VRM. NCP 302155 would be the component. And uh, again, Buildzoid will go through the specs of that. NCP 81022 on semi over here. Uh, controller of uh, of significance that again build it will hit in the electrical analysis. Let's see if we can pull this plate. Oh, there's a screw right here. So there's a screw down in the bottom corner I missed. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes thermal pads between the back plate and the PCB are totally irrelevant. It's just going to depend card to card. But it is a big piece of aluminum that can help spread heat. It's more effective when you have a fan over the back cooling it. Like maybe if you have a tower cooler, you get some additional airflow drafting over the back side of the PCB uh, and the back plate. Wow, that was very clean disassembly. A lot of the time we'll have cables back there for all the LEDs, but it looks like they had a better solution for that. So. Taking a look at the back, oh, we got one of our plastic washers, don't lose those. Back's pretty straightforward. There is a big thermal pad strip, looks like that's about a two mil depth if you wanted to replace one of these for some reason. It's actually measuring out at 2.5 if that is an accurate reading. It's kind of tricky to measure because they, they can form a little bit, but that's actually looking like a 2.5 which makes it a very thick thermal pad. Not not necessarily better, it just means it probably needed to make contact because of these standoffs. But uh, yeah, so you have a direct contact strip there for the VRM. No contact for the memory. Uh, this is all coated anyway with a plastic so that it doesn't short anything if it came into contact with the components. Sometimes the memory cooling is benefited. In this instance, it's totally irrelevant because the memory did so well anyway. The reason it benefits though, if you sync the memory into a backplate occasionally, is because these are flip chip packages, so that means the silicon is actually closer to the backside to the PCB layer than it is to the level, I should say, than it is to the top side where you have the black module. So anyway, that's the breakdown in that. And then we have LEDs down here. Is this lighting something? Oh, it's just lighting the uh, Nitro logo there. So LEDs for that, not really a surprise on cards these days. LEDs dotted along the edges up here gives you that. Actually, we didn't show it in the video, but there is a kind of more tasteful LED implementation on this card where it's accenting along the top of the card through a light, uh, light pipe, we'll call it, even though it's just standalone LEDs. And there's a, a rail of some kind back here we'll send to Buildzoid. So there's a bit of contact. Oh, uh, RGB LED header here if you want to synchronize it with some other stuff. And then additional information. There's an, uh, a very common, so this is an IR, International Rectifier 35217. That controller is found on pretty much all of the 5700 series cards, very common right now. So for the MOSFETs for the V-Core VRM, it's uh, on semi again, NCP 302155. And then let's check out who the memory is supplied by because 
our memory clock on this was actually pretty insane compared to some of the others. I really want to get the power play tables on this um, to see if we can push it a little further. And this does look like it would have LN2 pot clearance, by the way. So we could probably take it under LN2 if anyone actually cares. That's going to be Micron, actually. That's Micron memory. So we got lucky with the bin on this memory, or with the probably more likely the uh, the IMC on the GPU. So no problems hitting 950 on the memory, and we want to put under like power play tables and stuff like that, see if we can go further. If, again, if, if people care, content interest is going to die down eventually on these cards. But uh, up here we have actually some fuses. So this is something interesting Sapphire's been doing this generation. Uh, I'm sure they've done it before, but it's the first time I've opened Sapphire cards in a while, a couple generations. And fuses here, so if something blows up, it should blow the fuse first. As discussed with uh, Joe on his channel, Bearded Hardware, in a different teardown, this uh, is beneficial to the RMA process, makes it a little faster, cheaper for them. They can replace a fuse, hopefully, and get it going again and protect the actual circuitry behind it. And I think that's going to cover most of this section. The rest of that I'm leaving to Buildzoid. And then over here, we got most of the discussion on this already, but the heat pipes are probably, that looks like about a 6 mil. That's a 6 mil heat pipe. Really standard. As always, what you really care about here is not it's not more is more better because uh, you're really looking for contact area. So in this one, we can see that there's pretty basically full coverage of this heat pipe to the GPU. Full coverage here, pretty full coverage here. It's probably about 70% coverage, and then the rest is is, uh, is not wasted, but not as directly contacted. And then uh, this one, and then the top of this one, don't get quite as much coverage. So it's not about fatter heat pipes or more heat pipes. It's about coverage area of the die and uh, making it as, as direct as possible. Not necessarily, necessarily smooth, but, but direct. And heat pipe count, there's going to be one going, it looks like out this direction up here through top half. Uh, we should terminate in one, two, three, four, five heat pipes, I think. So, two, three, four, five heat pipes, yep. Five, six mils. We can go ahead and take these out as well, just do a full disassembly, get the shroud off of there. And these have plastic washers on them as well, so if you take this out, be careful not to lose that, or actually, those are rubber. I got them mixed up last time, too. So don't let those fall off. And uh, that's going to be for noise damping and vibration, so you don't get a like that metal rattle noise when the fans are spinning. So there's your heat sink. Uh, as noted, Sapphire's done a good job with this. It's it's not like it's a particularly hard science to do a heat sink compared to some of the other stuff that they're doing on these cards, like the electrical. But a uh, big isolated block for GPU, and then you split out over here to spread the heat, of course. And VRM heat sinking over here for the MOSFETs, and a separate base plate for the memory and part of the VRM. Um, the fins, for what it's worth, are vertical. So this doesn't really matter a whole lot because the fans are going to overpower everything else, all the resistances. But if you are using a case where this is right up against the glass on the top side, maybe you're a couple millimeters away, then it will be definitely warmer than if they were uh, going the other direction because you're ejecting all of that air into the glass on one side and um, that'll insulate the heat a bit. But for the most part, it's totally irrelevant uh, uh, with a card like this because it can overcome those types of limitations with just brute force. So that's that part, we'll leave that alone. The fans, if you ever have to Replace one of these. I'm sure Sapphire would be happy to RMA it for you, but if maybe it's out of warranty or you can't get support for some reason, let's look at what fan it is and how hard it is to replace. It's the, the most common failure on a video card is going to be the fan. I'm going to separate these on the mat as well. So it looks like, is this just one contact point? Oh, nice. I love these. That's what I think it is. Oh, yeah, these are awesome. So this is a... Uh, Sapphire's been doing this, XFX has done it as well, but these are always nice to see. Instead of a full cabled fan, they're actually terminating in pins and then a contact point. 
and it's just sockets. So if you need to RMA this yourself, you might even be able to just ask Sapphire for the fan and not have to send the card out for weeks at a time. And uh, if you can't get a fan from them for some reason, out of warranty, whatever, this particular model is an NTK HK Limited fan. They've used these on, a, on a, some of the Pulse models, I think, or at least the, the brand anyway, and uh, or some of the 5700 XT models outside of this one. The model is FD10015M12D. I'll just get, we can get a shot of that. So if you ever need to replace the fan on your own, that's what you would buy. Hopefully you can find it with this same spec. Some of them might be cabled, depending on how they're made. So that socket's here, one screw, very easy to replace. Love seeing that stuff for ease of maintenance. We're, we're big fans of uh, keeping stuff going, even as parts of it die, because you can normally fix them pretty easily. This is just going to be your mixture of uh, fan cables all bridging to each other, contacting the board. You can technically get RGB fans separately from Sapphire for, I think it's 30 extra dollars. And clearly, if you wanted to install them, that's like, say you buy them separately, they don't come installed, whatever, and uh, you want to add them later. It's that same process we just went through. You take one screw out, you remove the fan, and then you socket it in, and you add the screw back in. Trivial. Anyone can do that. And uh, as a reminder, you wouldn't have to do all this other stuff we did. You can leave the card 100% assembled. Don't have to repaste it, because all you're doing is replacing a fan. So good to see that stuff from Sapphire. Ease of maintenance is always good. And I think that's going to wrap pretty much all this. All we have up here is just a PCB with LEDs in it for the Sapphire nameplate, and, uh, and then just a, a plastic shroud. So that's the Sapphire Nitro Plus teardown. Really straightforward stuff in terms of disassembly. Uh, one of the things we look for in these, so first of all, we're looking for why is the cooler performing the way it is? Maybe it's bad, maybe it's good. Look at the MSI Evoke. We had some anomalous performance there. Took it apart and understood why. Part of its quality, assembly quality. Part of it's got PCB photos for Buildzoid. Let him handle the electrical, we'll handle the thermal, and split the workload that way. Uh, and then another part of it, and a really important one that we don't talk about too much, is how easy is the product to maintain on your own as it ages. It'll exit warranty, you'll have trouble getting parts from the manufacturer or getting support, and there's no reason uh, each company is going to have a different policy, obviously, so I'm not saying anything specifically about Sapphire here, but as video cards die, in quotes there, there's no reason to get rid of it only because a fan stops spinning. And so a lot of what we're looking for is how hard is it to replace the most common component failure on the video card? Or does it have simple protections like fuses that can blow uh, to protect the other circuitry so that you can pretty easily get an RMA on it? And all of that's really important to main maintaining the card, just maintenance overall. Um, we use the phrase quality of life features a lot when we're talking about video card coolers because the GPUs, ultimately, they're not too different. Once you're on a specific SKU, they don't deviate that much from each other. So that starts to change a little bit with things like the Kingpin cards, where it, the performance does jump more, but also not proportionate to the price. That's obviously made for something else. So anyway, maintenance is a major factor in what we look at. This one's very easy to maintain. It is more expensive, so it's not like that's a free feature that Sapphire just threw in. You do pay for it. It's a $440 card. The extra fans are 470. Once you're going that far into it, you're extremely close to 2070 super territory. So you really have to consider that side of the argument. You can check our review for more of that. If you want to see more about this card and how it performs thermally, acoustically, or in games, or in power targets. And that'll wrap this one. Thank you for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Or if you want to help us out directly, pick up one of the GN Teardown Toolkits that I used for this video. This is kitted out with all the screwdrivers you need for the easy cards, like this one, which is mostly different sizes of Phillips, or for the more advanced cards, like the RTX series, which uses a lot of different types of screws and about 70 plus of them. I think there's as many screws in the RTX Founders Edition cards as there are uh, RTX Ops, or whatever they called it, on the card. Thank you for watching. Check back for more. We'll see you all next time.